Hi, we're Eliza, Allison, and Carlin, and we're the hosts of Resolve Mysteries Podcast. Our podcast follows the 80s and 90s television show Unsolved Mysteries, hosted by Robert Stack. We have a love for true crime and the unsolved. If you don't remember Unsolved Mysteries, we forgive you, but you don't have to know to get into our show. If you like true crime stuff, ghost stuff, alien stuff, or just stories about weird shit like Bigfoot, this is your podcast. The stories we cover range from totally ridiculous to truly heartbreaking. We do detailed research on all of the segments that Unsolved Mysteries aired, then drink some wine and give you the latest updates on every case. We talk about stories that will leave you laughing, crying, and occasionally outraged. Resolve Mysteries podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite pods. Join us and perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Hello everyone. This is Tyler here at Formidable, a true crime podcast. I want to invite you to come join me as I drop multiple episodes weekly to give you your true crime fix. Now, I am personally a huge fan of true crime, and this is what has pushed me to do this. All of my stories are well-researched, but I do keep them shorter than your average true crime podcast to fit into your daily commute, so you don't have to pick back up later. I encourage you to check it out anywhere you listen to your favorite podcast. Just search Formidable, a true crime podcast, and while you're there, be sure to subscribe, follow, and leave a review if you enjoy. You can also find me on Twitter, at FormidableTC, and on Instagram, at Formidable. Ladies and gentlemen, this podcast, truly one of the most unusual ever recorded, contains dribble, slang, and frank discussion of subject matter which under no circumstances should be heard by small children, persons with a heart condition, or anyone who is upset easily. If you are such a person, or if you are the parent of a very small child in the room, we urge you to switch off your streaming device now. Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing very well. I've Good. got a really gruesome, gruesome, hard case That's what today. I heard. So I think um, we should probably keep we're just small go talk. In. I want everybody to take Edward's listener discretion, discretion into advisement. This is violent and very sexually graphic. I had never heard of this case before, but I did find it. It has been done on two separate shows, mm -hmm. Snapped, Killer to Couples, and The Killer Speaks. Oh, yeah. Actually came across it from a book called True Crime Missouri. Mm. And it's kind of weird because it only happened four hours away from us mm -hmm. in 2006 or 2005. And I'd never heard it, of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> it never came across the news. It, so I was kind of shocked mm. about it. Another thing I want to add, it's amazing how when you cross-reference books newspapers and tv shows mm -hmm. how much different the information oh is. yeah they'll give it's you different years bizarre mm -hmm. so i did find some trial transcripts and i'll let you know because i'm going to read it straight no oh, i can't wait from the transcripts because it was easier I, I got you and besides sometimes the truth really is stranger than this is bizarre yeah <laughs> About 30 miles southeast of Kansas City, Missouri, a man, we're going to call him Jack. Not his real name. Supposedly. I don't know. We're going to just call him Jack because it's easier that way. He headed out to his favorite fishing spot at Cinnabar Creek. Creek is actually larger than a creek that you yep. would think. This was on the evening of May 14th, 2006, which was actually Mother's Day of that year. Now, from the things that I've referenced, the newspapers, the TV shows, the book, I think Jack may have actually owned the land because it said that he knew the land very well. So when he came across a shovel that was in this large hole, it kind of shocked him because mm -hmm. he'd never seen anything like that before. So he looked around and he didn't see anything and he continued on fishing. Well, he got to thinking about that hole and he went back the next day. 
And there wasn't a hole there anymore. Instead, there was brush and debris, and the soil had been replaced. So Jack starts brushing off the soil. Don't do it, Jack. And it wasn't long before he uncovered a human hand. Oh, oof. So he calls the Lafayette County Sheriff's Department, and they come in to the scene, and the small, nude body of the deceased woman was brought in for autopsy. When the pathologist examined the body, they found traces of cocaine and trazodone in her system. Trazodone, which I think I'm saying it right. I think that sounds right. Is usually used as an antidepressant, but it's also used to help insomnia. Mm -hmm. So it's a sedative. The decedent's body was in good condition. They said it was fresh. There was no signs of decay. Because he was there the day before. Right. Correct. So it would had been recently buried Mm -hmm. or the woman had been recently killed. It hadn't been Mm -hmm. stored Mm -hmm. anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So there was no signs of decay. But however, there were signs that she had been choked and Mm -hmm. strangled multiple times. But it was determined that the actual cause of death was suffocation. There was also a post-mortem wound found to the head. Now, the pathologist surmised, there's your word, Chris, Chris. surmised, (laughs) that the woman's body was probably dropped when they were transporting her. And that caused the head wound? And that caused the head wound. Okay. The strangest thing was that the coloring of her skin was off. It was a lot different than what a normal deceased body would Mm -hmm. look like. And there's also a strange odor Mm -hmm. coming from the body. It smelled like a freshly washed load of white laundry. Really? She had been soaked in bleach. Oh. The police ran fingerprints, and they were praying and hoping that the fingerprints would match somebody in the system, because if they're not in the system, they're not going to get a match. Right. And they were lucky. They were able to identify the woman as 41-year-old Marsha Diane Spicer of Kansas City, Independence, Missouri. Now, Independence is just, like, right outside Kansas City. Right. Suburb. And I just wanted you to know that the Kansas City and Independence Police Department love to give speeding tickets every time I'm in the area. I get a speeding ticket. So if you are going. go so fast, Jen. So anyway, if (laughs) you come to True Crime Podcast Festival in Kansas City next year, you will hear me complain about getting a speeding ticket. Anyway, back to our story. (laughs) Marsha Spicer was a mother of two adult children, and she was also a grandmother of two. She had been trying to deal with the demise of a bad long-term relationship, and she really didn't do it very well. So she turned to drugs, Hmm, pretty much a meth addict. And she was homeless. And of course, being a meth addict normally turns into selling your body for sex. Trying to get the drug, yes. And what really makes me sad about this, I tried to find information on Marsha because I just didn't want her to be known as a drug Mm, addict. Marsha the meth addict, yeah. Or a, you know, Mm -hmm. prostitute or anything like that. There's nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. There is nothing at all. I could not find an obituary. Really? I couldn't say. Some of the interviews her daughter was on, and she was like, she was so funny. I was trying to get her to come live with me. I got an apartment in March, and she was killed in May. But it was just really sad that in the history books. She was homeless. She didn't have a job, so she was probably all over the place. But she was from Kansas City, and she died in Kansas City. But you would think that somebody would have something. She just, it's sad that the, some of these victims are only going to be known as, that. as drug addicts. Mm-hmm. or And you know that before she had a childhood, her stories are gone, basically. Yes. And it just, it really kind of breaks my heart. It happens all the time, Jen. In the book True Crime Missouri by Daniel Krahijic. You can spell it. K-R-A-J-I-C-E-K. Mm-hmm. The J throws me off there. I don't know if it's a J or a H. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, Daniel, if you're listening, give me a holler. Daniel interviewed one of Marsha's friends for the book, and the friend told Daniel, the author, that Marsha, out of all the crowd of the drugged-up fools, (laughs) that Marsha was the most loving and caring of them all. Mm -hmm. And Marsha regretted that her life had become the way it had been. Right. And she even had long talks with this friend trying to steer her away from the same life Marsha had and tried to get her on a better path. Yeah. 
God, what a hard life. Well, if she Seriously. had a daughter that had went and gotten an apartment, she did something right. You know what I mean? Like right. the daughter. But it's also said that she was sad because her son was married mm-hmm. and the wife didn't want her to have anything to do with. I can see that. I can understand that, but still, it's the mm-hmm. guy's mother. Mm-hmm. Once Marsha's body was identified, the police notified the family and they started interviewing Marsha's daughter. Her daughter tells them that the last time she had spoken with her mother was the Friday before Mother's Day, and they were making plans on what they can do to celebrate Mother's Day. And she'd been trying to reach her since then, but was unable to get in touch. She also told the police that Marsha had been dating, I guess, and kind of living on and off with this man who lived kind of in a very rough part of town, Mm -hmm. usually where the drug addicts skid row for... Mm -hmm. Kansas City, I guess they have a skid row. They do. Uh, But in the bad section of town. And Marsha really didn't know a lot about this man. Oh. He had called her a couple days prior and had asked if she had seen her mother. When the police asked, you know, well, when did this guy call? Well, we're going to call him Ed, right? When did Ed call? She said she called on Monday, which was when Marsha's body had been found. Hmm. So the police have a suspect. Ed's looking really good in their eyes. Mm -hmm. They think, you know what? A little suspicious he called. He called. Mm -hmm. Doesn't know the daughter, but he called her. The same day the body's found, he's setting up an alibi, right? Mm -hmm. So they drove out to where Ed lived. And when they get there, they find out that he's this older man. And Marsha's not the only one that's been living with him. It seems that, I don't know if it's through the kindness of his own heart, Mm -hmm. which I'm just going to go with that. Or if he was using this girl's, but he was having other women in Marsha's situation stay with him off and on. Right. He was letting other female addicts stay in the house. And probably having relationships, sort of dating all of them. I don't know. It's unsaid. One of the officers called it a flop house, basically. Now, Ed tells the police that the last time he had seen Marsha, she was getting in a car that was driven by a man and there was a woman inside. He didn't know who they were, but he saw her get in the car and they drove off, and that was the last time he ever saw her. But then when police speak with other women in the house, one tells them that Marsha had mentioned that she and Ed were going to go fishing this coming weekend. And where might that be, you ask? I'm going to say Cinnabar Creek. Correct. And that would be the weekend of Mother's Day? That would be the weekend of Mother's Day. Okay. Hmm. Not looking too good for you there, Ed. Doesn't look good for Ed. Police are going, okay, this is kind of weird. Weird coincidence. And it could be. I'm thinking Ed's pretty much our number one suspect right now. Mm -hmm. So they went kind of looking around the house. They didn't have a search warrant, but they they were free to look around the house. And they found a shovel covered in dirt leaning against the house. Similar to that other shovel. Well, we don't know if it was similar to the other shovel. It was just a shovel with fresh dirt on it. Okay. I'm assuming it was fresh dirt because... Most shovels usually are dirty, right? Not I think, mine. Anyway. I clean mine. Do you? No. With bleach? Yeah. So police secured a search warrant, and they started to search Ed's house. Inside, they find risque photos of Marsha. Oh. That's it. Oh, that's it? Nothing else. Okay. They had the dirty shovel and sexy photos of Marsha. Not enough evidence. No, not. Well, that it just if proved, they were dating each other, that doesn't mean anything. It just right. proved that Ed had a dirty shovel and he <sighs> knew Marsha. And a dirty mind. And they took <laughs> uh, yeah. pictures. Two and a half days after Marsha's body was found, a recovering drug addict named Lori, who had also lived at Ed's house, came to the police to say, you've got the wrong, you're looking at the wrong guy. Ed didn't do it. And in fact, I think I know who did. They all ran in the same circles. Mm-hmm. Right. So she knew. Lori tells how a friend of hers had given her name and number to their cousin, a man named Ricky. Mm. Lori stated that Ricky had called her about three months prior, and he was looking for a hookup. Now, what kind of hookup? He was interested in sexual things, Mm -hmm. not just sex, but sexual things. Please define that. Well, Lori admitted to police that her drug use, or better yet, Her need of wanting drugs Mm -hmm. had made her be a bit more adventurous in bed Mm -hmm. because she needed to do what she she needed needed to to do do to get 
the hit. That would be terrible. Things that he was requesting from her didn't phase her. But at this time, they only just had straight sex. When she met him, they just had straight sex. Mm -hmm. Like, as far as I know, as straight as they just had sex. Let's just put it vanilla that way. sex. Well, we don't know if it was vanilla, but it was just consensual sex between two people. Okay, I don't know how. Okay, it wasn't nothing freaky deaky. Yeah, as far as I know. Okay, but when she walked in, she wasn't unfazed when Ricky put on a video of him having sex with two women. That didn't bother her. Okay, after they had sex, Ricky shared his sexual fantasy with Lori. Mm -hmm. He said he wanted to have a threesome with her and another woman. Didn't phase her, right? Yeah. But what shocked her is when he told her that he wanted to end the threesome mm -hmm. by killing the other woman. Oh, that'd be a shocker. Right. He wanted to strangle the woman, the third person, mm -hmm. while she was performing oral sex on Lori. Ugh. She said that she could tell he was serious. Mm -hmm. He had a strange look in his eye like he looked through her, not at her, and he was, almost did not seem human at the point when he was talking so to her. creepy. But she was scared for her life. That's why I think I'd be going, oh, yeah, I gotta go. The detectives thought, uh, this is kind of weird, you know, we've got this addict here, and she's trying to cover up from Ed, maybe. You know, but, they, like, they well, didn't really take the story so serious. I gotcha, yeah. They were shocked by it, but they didn't take it so right, serious. Right. But then... She said, you know, I had, I was scared that I'd never make it out of this apartment. Right. So I just went along with it. That's pretty right? smart. Yeah. And she said, oh, well, yeah, well, how are we going to get rid of the body then? And this is when the police knew sh she was onto something. She said that Ricky told her that they would soak the body in bleach to get rid of all the evidence and they would never be caught. Oh. Hmm. So that piqued the interest of Yeah. The Little police. tidbit that they probably had not they released. They probably did not release. Right. So detectives mm -hmm. started to look into Ricky, and as soon as they saw who he was, they put him number one. Really? Mm -hmm. Was it because of his looks, or was it like after they talked to him, or you're going to tell me? I'm going to tell you. Yay. Now, Richard Dean Davis is this man's name, not to be confused with Richard Allen Davis, mm -hmm. who abducted Polly Class. Mm -hmm. Different state. Different person, just as sick. Richard Dean Davis was a 41 year old ex con. He had served one month shy of an 18 year sentence for a rape and sodomy conviction that happened That's in terrible. 1987. In fact, he had been out on parole for only 357 days. Really? He was eight days shy of a year. Hmm. Some people you can't fix. On May 17th, officers show up at the apartment that Richard rented. It was located on the main road in Independence, Missouri. Richard answered the door and let the police in. And while they were standing there talking to Richard, they noticed that Richard would not make eye contact with him. He was fidgeting around. Mm -hmm. Body he wouldn't language. wouldn't really answer the questions. But all of a sudden, this woman walked in in her, only her underwear. They don't know the woman. But they asked her to get dressed, <laughs> as one would. I mean, you don't want anybody coming to wow. say. So she got dressed. And so they start asking Richard more questions. And he's not really answering the questions. Yeah, a little shady. Right. And so they're like, you know what? Why don't we go down to the station and maybe we can talk it out? And he's like, no, I'm going to go call my lawyer. I'm not going to talk to you without a lawyer. Ugh. He goes back and makes a phone call to his lawyer. And the police start speaking with the woman, which is... Mm -hmm. He Richard's have left her girlfriend. There. Yep. They start talking to the woman, and they found out that her name is Dina Riley, and she has been dating Ricky for about six months. She is asking them why they are there, and they're like, "Oh, there's this. It's because of a murder." And she's like, "Oh, really?" And she's like, totally nonchalant. She didn't know about the murder. She's asking them questions, and mm -hmm. they're like, "Well, you know about Richard's background, right?" And she goes, "Oh, yeah, I know. He was in prison for." rape and recently out right mm -hmm. just totally nonchalant like it didn't matter no i'm deal. sorry but if i'm dating somebody and they say you know what i just got out of jail for 18 years yeah. for rape and sodomy that's a deal breaker that's a big deal breaker i don't care yeah. how much money he has he's gone <laughs> it's not gonna have any he's been in jail for 18 years the detective or the police officer said you know that 
Dina's very passive and very quiet, and they for sure think she's not a suspect. She doesn't seem like she'd be and she seems much to be of a warm. killer. I mean, she's like she's talking very warm. To them she's and, talkative, yeah, but she's very quiet and she's not saying much. Mm-hmm. But not in a suspicious right. way. Just that she's not. Yeah. She's very yeah. The police started looking around. While one of the officers is talking to Dina, the other one just kind of is glancing around the apartment because even though they don't have a search warrant, they can still look around the apartment. Unless right? you're stopped. Yep. You can't yep. go into drawers or anything, but if it's laying right out in the open, it's fair game. One of the officers saw that there was a notebook on the end table and it had been opened up and it was filled with scribbles. He wasn't able to get a clear look at it, mm-hmm. but he did notice words such as sexual desires. Ooh. Choking, mm. chasing, and victims. Oh, yeah. There's a red flag right there, yeah. buddy. So another thing that caught the officer's eye, he was walking down the hallway. Door to the bedroom was open. There was a video camera. Set up in there? Ooh, okay. At this point, after seeing the video camera in the bedroom, and it's pointed to the bed, mm-hmm. and seeing the notebook and seeing such words as choke and sexual desires and victims, the police are like, yeah, we're pretty sure this is, we're going to need a search warrant. So they try to secure the area and they ask the couple to leave the apartment and then they go outside and they call in a search warrant. Well, at first they weren't able to get a search warrant because the judge did not think there was enough evidence. Mm -hmm. The next day they were able to get the search warrant and they found that Dina and Richard were gone. I skipped town. I knew that. They went on the lam. What happened was Dina called a friend of hers and said, listen, police are sniffing around up here. We need you to come pick us up. And Mm -hmm. the friend's like, okay. Because that's what a good friend does. Right. Not. That'll get you in jail. Let's stop here. And let's go into a little bit about Richard and Dina, shall we? Let's. Let's. I know a lot about Richard. Not too much about Dina. Richard Dean Davis was born on July 9th, 1964. He was one of four kids. And his parents divorced when Richard was in first grade Mm -hmm. and his mother remarried. Now, I read in one place, you know, things differ. I read in one place only that supposedly at six years old, Richard shot his father and wounded him. Not seriously, but Mm. just shot him. Don't know if that's real. Mm. I only read it one place. So here's a little bit of uh, this is what I got from the trial notes. So I'm going to just read it from the trial, Mm -hmm. except the doctor's name because I can't pronounce it. Okay. You just call him doctor. The psychiatrist testified that physical and sexual abuse, including beatings by the stepfather, lack of interpersonal connections in Richard's family, as well as his exposure to non-consistent adult figures, prevented normal development. I'm telling you, these doctors need to like dumb down their words for us dumb folk. The doctor also testified that by the age of six, family members were setting up real or simulated sex acts for Richard and his sister to engage in. Together? Yes. By the age of 10, Richard was engaging in sexual activity with a number of people. By age 15, regular sexual activity had become routine. That's in quotations. And Richard became involved in anal sex rough sex, and group sex at 15. At 15. Did he go to school? Do you know? Hold on. An aunt made him engage in sexual activities with his sister. His aunt made him engage in sexual activities and with his sister. His a, aunt. His aunt. And supposedly his aunt would always talk to him about her sexual escapades. That is sick. People are sick. There's also evidence indicating that Richard was molested by his stepfather. Oh, I'm sure of it. And they fought all the time, the stepfather and the son. Mm -hmm. So by age 10, Richard was a chronic runaway. Do you blame him? No. I don't blame him at all. should have. Should have gotten. If he would have gotten away, maybe this would have all. Yeah. God, only if he would have told somebody, they would have gotten him out of there. He hardly attended school and eventually he dropped out. That's so sad. By 13, he left home for good. He either stayed with friends or he lived on the streets. He also had a few stints at the Western Missouri Mental Health Center Mm -hmm. where he was diagnosed as being depressed, angry, and anxious. Yeah. You think? Yeah, of course. Really? 
you think? I'm telling you, the damage that is done to these people so young, you can't fix that. That's what this, there was a psychologist on there that's just like, you know, he didn't wake up one day saying, you know what, I'm yeah. going to be a sociopath. This, this is why. was inflicted on him. Yep. From the age of 13 on, Richard was involved with breaking and entering, petty thefts, all sorts of trouble. So he was in and out of juvenile detention centers. As an adult, pretty much the same thing. When he wasn't in prison, he couldn't keep a job. And he would always blame it was everybody else's fault. It wasn't his fault. He was doing everything right. It was everybody else's mm -hmm. fault. So finally, he was just getting so many little charges. The police bundled the charges of larceny, breaking and entering, receiving stolen property. Mm -hmm. They bundled it all together and gave him a three-year sentence in 1984. After serving a little bit over two years, 26 months to be exact, he was paroled and he was 21 years old. So in 1987, a 27-year-old woman was driving down the road when she spotted a man with on the shoulder on his car with the hood up, which mm -hmm. is the international sign of I need help, right? <laughs> the sign of my car broke my down. My car broke down. Being the good-hearted person she was, no. she pulled over to see if she could help. Mm -mm. Well, Richard got in the car with her and pulled a knife. He made her take him out somewhere mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere with no one around. And he proceeded to beat, rape, and sodomize her. He held the knife to her throat the entire time. Now, he let the woman go. And the police later were able to identify him because, I guess, his car was still on the side of the road. And they were able to trace his plates <laughs> back to him. He's not real smart. He went to prison, and at first he pled not guilty in that it was consensual sex, and she liked it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then he figured, well, you know what, if I plead guilty, I'll get a lesser charge, right? So he was sentenced. It never did give me how many years that he was. Oh, that's, I thought that was the 18, 86, well, 96. But he was paroled. I'm assuming he got like 20 to 25 years. But he was let go at 18? Right. Okay. But after serving... Okay. Just shy of 18 years, Richard told the parole board that what? I'm innocent and I'll never do it again. I'm fixed. I found God. Oh, well, there's that too. I found God in prison. I'll never do it again. Yep. I swear. I know I've fixed At my least ways. for one year or shy. I'm reformed. I'll mm -hmm. never do it again. I'll get a job. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to do right. So on May 25th, 2005, Richard Davis walked out of the state prison in Bonterre, Missouri. Mm. Mm. The psychiatrist later said that his anger and his sexuality became associated to each other. Mm -hmm. He developed a fascination for violent and dangerous sex. He was a sexual sadist, but not your common everyday BDSM fetish way. The clinical term basically is he suffered from a sexual sadism disorder. Now, psychology today pretty much says the clinical term basically of any kind of sexual preference thing is called paraphilia. And psychology today defines paraphilia as a condition in which a person's sexual arousal and gratification depend on fantasizing about and engaging in sexual behavior that society may view as distasteful, unusual, or abnormal. And sexual Sadism is a paraphilia, but the paraphilia becomes a disorder when it causes distress or threatens to harm someone else. So if you like sadomasochism or if you're into BDSM, you do not have a disorder. But since Richard liked hurting people I and could it. only be gratified needed sexually that. through hurting people, he had the sexual sadism disorder. I want to, just want to make this clear. I don't oh, yeah. want anybody coming to me and saying, "No, I know." You know, it's not a disorder. Just because you like getting, you do you. Boo! I, I don't care what you want to do. Just but, don't but hurt when others. You ha yeah, consensual. As long as it's consensual, I don't give a damn. The Vampire of Dusseldorf. This is where this took me, right? Because mm -hmm. his thing was blood squirting. Mm -hmm. He liked that. Got him off, and he could not ejaculate without. He couldn't get off unless he could hear that. So he would purposely fake helping injured people just to hear that and stuff. And so that when they executed him, they chopped his head off. 
He wanted to know if Smart. the head would, yeah. And that makes you wonder why, what in his life caused him to like that sexually. I can't you remember. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because there has to be like how you a, equate the two together. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, it's like anything. Yeah. If you're addicted to it and it changes your way you live or harm somebody or it becomes to where you have to have that in order to do what you need to do, mm-hmm. that's a problem. Yeah, it's a big problem. I do want to say when he did leave prison after he went all Jesus and said, I'm going to go to church, he did for a while. He got a job. He went to church and got an apartment and he was living fairly good life Mm -hmm. for a while. He was doing what he needed to do for a while. That's pretty much all that I have on Richard for today. Sounds like a catch. He is a catch. So let's talk about Dina. Dina Dolores Riley was born sometime in 1968. From what I can tell, it seemed to be a nice, normal family. Upbringing. Mm. Suburbs of Kansas City, stay-at-home mom, you know, the whole Mm. works. Mm. Uh, One of the shows said that she suffered from inadequacy, which I can totally see that. But she married at the age 17, and she had three kids in five years. That's hard. Mm. It said that she soon grew very bored of motherhood. In fact, by the time the, th- the third one wasn't even born yet, and she was just tired of the whole situation. So she turned to drugs and having sex outside the marriage. She just wanted to liven things up. Uh-huh. And her ex-husband told the Kansas City Star, the newspaper in Kansas uh-huh. City. I'm sure that was obvious, but I just wanted to make That's sure that it was a new- newspaper. Uh, she felt that she missed out because she got married right out of high school. Her husband then divorced her and got custody of the kids, and that was in 1990. Okay. In The Killer Speaks, Dina claims a little bit different. Now, she admits that she's always done drugs. She always smoked marijuana, but she claims that her husband was a mean drunk Mm -hmm. and would often, I don't think he actually beat her, but she just said that it got to the point where she left him. Mm -hmm. And then she said she lost the kids in the divorce and her drug addiction had gotten out of control. She started doing more drugs and then became addicted from, she'd start with marijuana and then she went to cocaine and then she would, you know, Mm -hmm. ended up with meth basically. For about 15 years, 15 years, Dina was an addict Mm -hmm. with one drug or another and she lived on the streets. She spent time in jail. She sold her body for drugs or money for drugs. Mm -hmm. The menial jobs, at one point she said she had 14 jobs in one year oh. because if she didn't like a job, she'd just walk out. Pro- or she didn't she care. probably had trouble showing up too. But on September of 2005, Dina got a part-time job at a tool and dye factory or a metal fabrication. Mm-hmm. That's where Richard worked. He was a janitor. One said he was a janitor. Another one just said he worked at a factory. And the other one said he was some kind of audio guy. So I don't know what he was. Probably I'm going to go with custodian. Most of everyone said he was a custodian or janitor. So that's what we're going with. The two started talking and they both had such a complicated background that they grew close, started dating. And then by December of 2005, Dina moved in very quick. Hmm. Dina said that she'd never had a relationship like she had had with Richard. He was kind and very charming. And this kind of made me laugh, but it's more sad than anything. Mm -hmm. She liked that he had a full-time job, his own place. He didn't do drugs, and he had food in the refrigerator. That's really sad. Isn't that awful? Yes. Richard liked the fact that Dina wanted to please him and would do whatever he wanted. She was very easily manipulated by him. They can pick out each other. You know what I mean? They can. These people end up doing that. Soon after she moved in, Richard started asking Dina to have threesomes. She agrees. And in The Killer Speaks, she starts to say how common threesomes are. And then she corrects herself by saying her circle of friends in the dope world, (laughs) it's common with them. I was going to say, I must be missing out if it's common because I I kind of feel lost because nobody's asked me for one. (laughs) Not for a long time. (laughs) Not that common, Jen. I know. So... 
Then he started asking her if she wanted to videotape, if it would be okay if he would start videotaping her. And of course she agreed. And she said that she always knew that if she did threesomes, that's when she would get her meth. He would buy her meth. So she's still doing drugs. Oh, yeah. She oh. was messed up on meth. Oh. Messed up. <laughs> yeah. They would go out at night looking for a third person. And Richard would lure these women back to the house with meth. Mm. Then he would videotape these women. And then it slowly progressed where he started to get very violent. And he would demean these women. During so, the act? During he, he the would, sex. Okay. These women were just thinking that they were going to have normal threesome sex, mm -hmm. but and they would end up being beat and, and they were tied it, up. Probably. And it he, was getting to be more sadomasochism. They were getting beaten for his pleasure. Right. It was much more than sex mm -hmm. that they were getting. And I'm guessing these kind of meth. were the people that needed drugs. These were drug addicts, right. homeless women so they, on the yeah, street. They had to do, yeah. Soon he's finding, you know what, these violent threesomes aren't enough. He confesses to Dina that he needs more, that he has this fantasy that he wants to strangle women during sex. Now, we know this because Lori told us. Mm -hmm. Now, back to where we left off. The police get the search warrant to go through Richard's apartment, and Dina and Richard are on the lam. Police get inside the apartment, and they... Just as soon as they get in, they find the notebook. And basically, the notebook was filled with all of his sex fantasies. It had plans on how he would pull them off and what woman he wanted. Like, if the woman, we need to go here because she's here and we get her and this is what I want and I want Dina to do this. He would plan it out and he would map it out, wrote it all down in that notebook. They also found in their video player a two hour tape marked. Marsha. Why would they not take that with them? They're not very smart. Uh, yeah, I know. Obviously. They just left. This is where it kind of gets really graphic, so excuse me. Turn it off if you need be. The police watch this two-hour tape with Marsha on it, and they see Marsha on the bed, mm. hands tied together, duct tape over her eyes. She has a gag in her mouth, and Richard and Dina are violently raping her. Ugh. When Marsha would cry... Dina would slap her and tell her to stop it. They tortured Marsha for hours. Mm -hmm. Just tortured her, beating her, choking her until the verge of death. Just horrible. They drugged her first and plied her with pills, but she was still... I guess because they didn't want her to fight back. She I'm was assuming. more compliable. Yeah. I'm sure they smoked meth before any of this happened. But the torture that she went through, just it lasted for hours. Upon just hours the video would show Richard raping and beating Marsha while Dina held the camera. Ugh. And then they would switch and Dina would beat Marsha and sodomize her. And it just kept going on and on. The police were Marcia. disgusted by it. Actually, some of the police had to end up going to see a psychiatrist. I was going to say, I to talk you, it out because it was even... so scarring right. to and, see and watch it. And, and that was one of many tapes. The detective said, that even though watching that video was shocking, the most jaw-dropping part was the very end of the video. I don't know. What? Dina straddles Marsha's head Ugh. in a sexual way. Yeah. And smothers her and stays on her until Marsha quits moving With and her is dead. private part? Her crotch. Oh, my God. Naked crotch. She's just as crazy as he is. Not if you listen to the killer speaks. Mm, She's got a soft heart. Nope. Once Marsha is dead, Dina turns to Richard. So he, she killed him. She, I'm sorry. She Dina killed, killed Marsha. Marsha by sitting on her face. Is that what he wanted? He wanted her to do it? He just I thought, wanted the girl to die. I thought he wanted to choke him. Or... Well, they had been choking her. But oh, he... Marcia. Richard just wanted to watch a woman die, I think. It's disgusting. So after Marsha was gone, Dina and Richard kissed while Dina was still on top of Marsha. That's disgusting. One of the officers said that it was apparent that these two people had completely lost their humanity. Yeah, they, they did. They were monsters. Yeah, I would agree with that. So then the police 
come across a tape that's not marked, doesn't have a woman's name on it, nothing. Mm -hmm. They play it and they find another woman, but they don't know who it is. The person hadn't been reported missing, eh? Well, there's no name on the tape. Right. No name was mentioned during the tape, so they had no clue who the woman was. Oh, okay. So the video was the same thing that happened with Marsha. Dina did the same thing to her? But could not smother her. So So they're thinking, okay, we've got serial rapists or serial killers. What's going on, right? Mm Mm-hmm. That is awful. So they didn't know, and they needed to find out who this woman was. So she she lived? Well, they need to find out who the woman is. They don't know Okay. at this point. Police send a photo or a screen grab, basically, of the video of the woman's face, and they send it to all the police departments in Missouri. They got lucky because a police officer had recognized this woman because not too long ago he had filed a missing persons report. Mm. The woman has a name, finally. And her name is Michelle Huff. Ricky is how it was pronounced in one of the shows, or Ricci. It's spelled R-I-C-C-I, like Christina Ricci. Mm-hmm. I would say Ricci. I would say Ricci, too. Okay. So I'm just going with Michelle. Right. Okay. So Michelle was a 36-year-old woman who had also fallen on hard times and had turned to a life of drugs. And she was last seen going for a walk a couple weeks prior to when Marsha's body was found in late April. So on May 22nd, the police issue an all points bulletin or an APB for Richard and Dina. They're considered fugitives of the state, and they also bring charges, including first degree murder, kidnapping, and rape. At one point, the police said that for a time, these people were the most wanted couple in the United States. Mm -hmm. I believe that. I mean, look what they did. It's horrible. They're maniacs. Police start to track them using cell phones and credit card purchases, as police are apt to do, Mm -hmm. right? They found that the couple went to St. Louis. Then they went down south to Perryville. That's where they had a friend in Perryville. Then they went back to Kansas City and got some meth, did some meth. And then they headed south and crossed the border into Kansas. On May 24th, A few days later, in Kansas, they stop at one of their relatives' houses. Mm -hmm. The relative had no idea that they had been wanted for murder. I mean, they knew about Richard's past, but did not know about the current situation. Mm -hmm. They spent the night, and the next day, they got permission to take the relative's five-year-old daughter to McDonald's. Why would you let that happen? Because they're relatives? Trusting? No. I mean, they had to have known that he was in jail for the first time. Instead of taking the girl to McDonald's, they took the little girl across state lines to Missouri, Mm -hmm. and they spent hours molesting her. Unbelievable. When the girl didn't come home after several hours, the parents called 911 and report her missing, and that's when they they... learn about the murder charges. You'd be frantic. (sighs) I'd be on... And I guess when they, when they called the police, when she called the old. police, they wanted the name of the relative. Yeah, she said, I mean, she said that, was, you know, no. who is it? And they're oh like, yeah, gosh. we're he's wanted. We're looking for them. They're wanting for murder. Yeah. Could you imagine how no. dumb you would feel and your heart would drop and... No, you'd probably immediately vomit, really. Oh, my gosh. So at around 4.45 p.m. on May 25th, Dina placed a 911 call to the sheriff's office, and it went to the sheriff's office at Lamar, Missouri. She told the detectives they had wrecked the car because her and Richard had been popping pills and drinking because they wanted to commit suicide because of what they did. To the baby, the five-year-old? Just everything. Everything, okay. They also had made a tape, a recording, where... With the baby? It was kind of like... The baby was still in the car. Yeah. Baby was still alive? Yeah. They just had molested her. But they also made kind of a a tape of a last will and testament type thing where Richard tried to explain what he had done. And he said, quote, how we got to this point, we just don't understand. And then it's also said that he said something to the fact was this madness has got to stop. So he had a glimmer of he knew what was going on and he said i wish me and dina had normal lives we're bad people whoever listens to this tape don't hit your kids 
What? I guess, oh, I, I see. He's pointing back to him being beaten up as a child, right? Mm-hmm. Shortly after the 911 call, the police are there, and they arrested the two without any problems. Mm-hmm. They were so drunk and s- had so many pills in their system that it, they were an easy yeah. arrest. And the officers took the little girl and immediately took her to the hospital where she was treated for her wounds. Unbelievable. Uh, another source said that she wasn't hurt at all in the car accident, but her shorts were bloody. I can't even... Ugh. So when the two were in custody, sobered up, they confessed to everything. They told how Richard picked up Michelle and had exchanged sex for drugs. And normally, you know, Michelle was thinking it would just be a few hours for a couple hits, right? Mm-hmm. It turned into days. Mm. All the while, she was being raped, tied up, tortured, and choked. They experimented multiple times with trying to suffocate Michelle. They experimented on it. Dina would try to suffocate her, Michelle, mm-hmm. by sitting on her face mm-hmm. in a sexual manner. Mm-hmm but could never do it, and they tried it over and over and over again. They held Michelle for 72 hours or more, and they both agreed that there's no way that they could let her go. No way. She'd tell. So they forced sedatives and alcohol down Michelle's throat and took her out into the middle of nowhere, where Richard forced her to undress, and then he killed her, I'm assuming by strangulation. It's been said by strangulation but we don't know for sure. The next day, Richard started to worry about DNA evidence and identifying the body, so he asked Dina to go out and pick up some charcoal and lighter fluid. He went back out to Michelle's body and set it on fire to get rid of the DNA. They also said where they could find Michelle's body. So they admitted with Marsha that they soaked her body in a bathtub of water with bleach, a gallon of bleach, and They kept her there for 10 hours to make sure everything was killed or all the DNA was gone. While Marsha was soaking in the bathtub, the two went to one of their nephew's graduation parties. Man, they are All the while, dead woman in your bathtub and you go to a party. And continue like... Like everything's normal. Right. Oh. Richard also told the police that there were more videos of Marsha and other women... And they were hidden at the factory where he worked at. Wow. Two more tapes of Marsha. Oh Two God. more. How long was a videotape? 90 minutes? Two hours? Three hour videotapes? I don't know. They both pleaded guilty, of Good. course. Well, they kind of had to because they had a video. The videotapes well, were pretty much a confession. They, they could deny it. it yeah. But during the trial, the jury had to sit through an edited version of that the be, videotape of Marsha. That would be unbelievable. And they, of course, provided doctors because of how scarring that it could have been. And I don't even know if that would be necessary, I guess, to demonstrate the... To watch a woman die? That would be... I just don't know that... I don't know if that would be needed, necessary for them to see all that, right? Yeah. When Richard was interrogated, he told them, he told the police, that the only way that he could release his tension was to engage in threesomes. And then when his fantasies got darker, they got criminal. Mm -hmm. Richard was sentenced to death. He did an appeal in 2016 saying he was bipolar and that caused it, but nobody believed him. He is now waiting for his sentence to be carried out at the Potosi Correctional Center. Dina took a plea deal, Mm -hmm. and now she kind of claims that it was all Richard's fault and she's... What did she do? How was that even possible? She's the one that actually... Killed. Yeah. You guys need to watch The Killer Speaks. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, I think it's two ninety nine for the episode. You have to pay for it. But she is unbelievable. And I wanted to strangle her. You wanted she to reach was, through the TV screen it, and punch she, her? She's, she's trying to make off like she's this, in a, this bystander who just, Richard did it all. Did she claim that he forced her and she was scared so that's why she did she it? She loved him and she'd do anything for him. And there's crocodile tears and all this kind of stuff. But Dina took a plea deal and pled guilty. She was sentenced to life without parole in the slaying of Marsha Spicer. Plus, she got eight additional life sentences and 239 years in prison for 25 other counts. So we She's not going anywhere. Good. 
Plus, she got another life sentence for the kidnapping of the little five-year-old. I can, I... mm. And she's serving her sentence out in Chillicothe Correctional Center in Chillicothe, Missouri. It's enraging, and it's heartbreaking. And those poor victims, we know nothing about except that they were drug addicts. Mm -hmm. And that makes me very sad. I think we need to do better at humanizing the victims. Well, the one had a daughter. Marsha had a daughter, right? Marsha had a daughter and a son. And the daughter they spoke to. And Yeah. And they did speak with the daughter on film, Mm -hmm. on camera, the two TV shows. But to look it up on the internet. You just can't find anything about her. I can't find anything about her. Like, you know, why couldn't, Mm. when they were describing, you know, Marsha was 41, why did they have to say she was a drug addict? Why couldn't they have said she'd fallen on hard times? She, She had accomplishments. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Let's not. But I, can, I, those those two jerkheads knew that. I mean, they knew who to. They, well, they were too. On her. But well, no, that, he didn't do drugs. He didn't do drugs at he all. He didn't do drugs at all. That was part of the reason why Dina liked him so much because he didn't do drugs. No, that's the weird. only drugs he took was for his bipolar disorder. Mm-mm. But otherwise, he was just this deviant sex monster. He knew, and what he, he was wanted doing too, his you know? lifelong thing was to make a snuff film, basically, and he succeeded. But it's heartbreaking that these women are in newspapers mm-hmm. are just going to be remembered as mm-hmm. drug addicts who sold their bodies for. Well, like I said, Marsha had two kids. She did something right. I she, mean, did. she did, even though she had a, a horrible relationship. She had to have been. There was more to her life than to just be reduced to a drug addict. Well, and I think a homeless drug addict. This Same is a, with Michelle. This is a good example of how badly child abuse affects yeah. people, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, you just can't. Some people you cannot fix, and that's the parents of both of them. Like it just... Well, it sounded like it all went to shit when the stepfather came into the picture. And they did give the name of his stepfather, but Lord knows I'm not going to... No, don't. yeah, don't. that's all we need. Mm-mm. That but was it, really good, Jen. It's, it's yeah. just the two things. I just feel so sorry for these victims because... We know so much about Dina and Richard. That happens a lot, though. I know, you know, but it you know a lot more about the killer right. than you do the victim. Right. I mean, I don't need to know. It would be nice to know that Marsha did. Marsha get up and make cinnamon buns every Sunday morning, or even if she didn't, even if mm-hmm. it just something more about her life. Mm-hmm. Don't even know yeah. her birthday. Yeah. Oh. No, actually, I do. It was October eighteenth. Oh. Okay. But anyway, there's just a lot more information that needs to be said about victims. I agree with you. I agree. Just made me sad. All right. Good job, Jen. Thanks. Who knew it was from Independence, Missouri, huh? I Kansas City. I did not know they were from. I knew about the case because I watched too much TV. I didn't realize it's been, you know, I don't know when I saw it, but I don't, I forgot. Yeah. Or didn't make the connection that they're local. I don't, I mean, even his appeal, it was in the St. Louis Post Dispatch. In 2016, I never even mm-hmm. heard about it then either. So mm-hmm. I was just kind of floored that that totally escaped my yeah, that's crazy. My true crime eye and and maybe, yeah, but if you didn't know it, I I don't know. You know, yeah, that's just sad. What about parole? Let's get on to parole. The guy was paroled. That's just a whole the first time. Like the, like why wasn't he reporting to somebody if he brutally, well he did for a while. Mm-hmm. He should never have been paroled for the first time. Mm-mm. Well, he brutally raped and sodomized a woman who was convicted for it, and he was that put pulled on over parole. to help them. That's right. the crazy part. And he was given parole. I don't think that should have happened either. Or do that I? would have saved Nor a bunch of do I. problems later. All well, right. Anyway, that was a good sorry. story, Jen. Thanks. Thanks. Um, hey, if you guys have anything you want to say or comment, you can email us at our true crime podcast at gmail.com. We have a Twitter account. You can hit us up at our true crime pod on the Twitter sphere. We have a blog at www.ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Don't forget to write and rate us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever else has. Wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Reviews. We would be very pleased if you would leave us a nice one, if you like it, and if you would. That's That's about it, I think. That's about it. All right, so remember, you guys, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows and motorists on the side of the road. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya.
was Reggie. I didn't fart. <laughs> do they say fart in England? What do they say over there? Flatulate? Can God? I don't know. Pass, mm-hmm. I, we need to know what that. Yeah, tell us, us what know. fart is. <laughs> I'm gonna look it up. I uh, also I wish you could hear this. Reggie has an owl adversary outside, so every time you play a barred owl noise, he goes fucking insane. <laughs> it's and it is so funny. The funniest. Oh thing my god! Ever. It's so funny. You can play dogs howling. You could play dogs barking. You could play all sorts cats, of noise. Cats, nothing, and... nothing phases him. But the minute you put on a barred owl, man, he goes shit crazy. I think it's funny. It is funny. So anyway, here's quiet, and then Camille will start. It says Trump means fart in British slang. Oh yeah, it does. Does it? That's right. Yeah. It's called it's little Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Two and a half days after Marsha's body. Two days later. Two days. SpongeBob. Mm-hmm. Two and a half days after Marsha's. Uh, sorry, Nico. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. That was you. That was me. For a rape and sodomy convention. Convention. <laughs> that sounds like a fun place to go. <laughs> He would have terrible. loved to have a rape inside of That would be terrible. Convention. I wonder hey, how much one of those would cost. I notebook because I like to do to when you're talking to me because I'm about to fall asleep just staring at you. Oh, my God. That's so funny. That that's wasn't funny. That's not funny, but no, it is funny. It's funny. It's just rewarding because then you carried it off. Yeah.